You know, somebody developed a computer program a few years ago where you could take your family album, lots of pictures of the family and different events, and you send them to this group and you say, uh, here's a picture of grandma. I want you to create a mosaic of grandma's face with the pictures of the whole family. And they would do that. You'd look and you'd think, oh, that's a mosaic of grandma. But you zoom in, and it's really all of the family pictures. Well, someone at a church got an idea. Well, they ought to do that with Jesus. And so this church with hundreds of members uh, sent all their photographs in, their family photographs, and they took it. And when you look at that, you think you're seeing a picture of Jesus' face. But each one of those tiles, when you zoom, zoom in, is actually portraits of the different people who are members of that church. And I thought, well, that's, that's a great analogy of what the church is, really, is you and I are the body of Christ. We create this mosaic. But the Bible also does that with Jesus, in that the whole Bible and all the stories in the Bible, they are like tiles in a mosaic that gives us the picture of the face of Jesus. And we'll see then as we proceed. You remember the verse we talked about there in Luke chapter 24? tells us Jesus said to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The whole Bible is telling us about Jesus. And the, the story of Joseph, Joseph in particular is like a many-colored tapestry of Christ. So I hope you have your Bibles, and you can join me by turning right now. We're going to kind of pick up where we left off and go to the book of Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. Uh, today we're probably just going to get through Genesis chapter 37. And I want you to go down near the end, and you can see, again, we're looking at Jacob makes it back to the promised land, and before he gets all the way back home, Rachel dies. And you can read, it says here, in giving birth to Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother, verse 18, and it was so as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which means son of my sorrow, but his father called him Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. Of course, the word Ben in the Bible means son, and also you'll find the word Bar means son of. And so um, here, Rachel dies giving birth in Bethlehem to the son of his right hand. And Jesus, of course, is the son of the right hand. He is born in Bethlehem. Now, the name Rachel means you, like a, a mother sheep. And a you has lambs. And Mary, I'm sorry, Rachel's first, I must say Mary had a little lamb. Uh, Rachel's first Boy, the firstborn son of Rachel was Joseph. And he is a type of Jesus, one of the most profound types of Jesus in the Bible. It's an amazing story about, and you know, the story of Joseph. Uh, it is so intriguing, it's so incredible that um, it's better than fiction. Around the world, you've got millions, if not billions, of Christians, Jews, Muslims, that take this story as fact from antiquity, but it is such an incredible account. So Rachel has this lamb, and Rachel dies in Bethlehem, and I think you can see the analogy there. Now, part of the reason we went back to Genesis chapter 35 is one of the last verses, and it's sort of a sad spot, but it plays big into the future story. If you go to verse 22, it tells us that Israel dwelt in that land, and it happened, while Israel was dwelling there, that Reuben, Reuben is the firstborn, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, that was Rachel's maid that became a surrogate mother for two of Jacob's sons. She, of course, was younger than Rachel, and Reuben was the firstborn, and they had a, 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 a little adventure together. And uh, his father's concubine and Israel heard of it. You know, when you live in a compound of tents, it's hard to keep those things secret. And this caused a real problem in the family.
For one thing, at that point, Jacob decided, I am not going to give Reuben the blessing of the firstborn because he forfeited that. It also probably did something to his relationship with Bilhah. And so that plays into the story of Joseph a little later, as you're going to see. So with that, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. And this is probably where we're going to spend our time this morning. And we're going to look and discover a number of ways that Jesus is a type, I'm sorry, Joseph is a type of Jesus. Now Jacob dwelt, this is verse 1, Genesis 37, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, it's interesting, it starts out, here's the history of Jacob, and it starts with Joseph, who is the 11th son, but Joseph is the firstborn of Rachel. And what was the wife that Jacob wanted? He only wanted one. He ended up with four. He only wanted Rachel. He loved her. He served for her. Then he got tricked. Of course, that kind of was payback because Jacob had done some tricking too, huh? And then when the two sisters are having trouble procreating, they urge Jacob to do what Abraham did. Sarah urged on Abraham, and uh, as Abraham took Hagar, they took Zilpha, or Jacob took Zilpha and Bilhah, and he ends up with four wives. But it starts out talking about Joseph. Being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha. Now, of course, Leah was still alive at this point, the sister of Rachel, and she was the principal wife now of Jacob. And um, Leah had seven children. Leah is the one who was buried with Jacob in the cave of Machpelah along with Isaac and Rebekah and Abraham and Sarah. So just the patriarchs and the, wife, the wives through whom Jesus came, Hagar was not buried there. Rachel was not buried there. The Bible says when Rachel died, I didn't read it, but the Bible says when Rachel died in Bethlehem, Jacob set up a pillar. He set up a stone which is very interesting because what happens to Jacob when he leaves to go to Haran and look for a wife? He has that dream of a ladder to heaven and he sets up a stone. And then it tells us that when he first sees Rachel, there was a stone that was blocking the waterway for the sheep. Jacob moves the stone and then he kisses Rachel. And now he gets back to the promised land. Rachel dies and he sets up a stone. And of course, these are, there's a whole other study on Christ being the rock. So it um, tells us that uh, they were shepherds. Now, what kind of shepherd was Joseph? He's a good shepherd. Notice, as you read with me, that uh, we're going to discover a few different things about um, Joseph. Joseph is the beloved son. He is the rejected sibling. And he is the faithful servant. And then you'll see him later as the sovereign. First, he is the beloved son. It says in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, and Israel loved jo Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Now, it's not a good thing to have favoritism in the family. It can cause division. It's hard for a school teacher not to have the teacher's pet and show favor favoritism though they sometimes do. And uh, how many of you have siblings? Should be most of you. How many of you feel like your parents had a favorite? Let me see your hands. Is that a healthy thing? What happened with Jacob and Esau when Isaac favored Esau and Rachel favored Jacob? That caused some problems. And you would have thought Jacob would have learned from that, but now he makes it really clear to everybody, I didn't really want all these extra wives, and then you got the other sons, but he really loves Joseph. Now, the, Rachel, the Bible says Rachel was beautiful, and then it later tells us that Joseph was handsome. Some of it came through the genes. But um, so he's a good-looking boy, and uh, he is the favorite son of Jacob's favorite wife, and he had a hard time hiding that. And Jacob decided, Joseph is the firstborn of the wife I wanted. I am going to give him the inheritance 
of the firstborn. And as a signal of that, because he is the beloved son, he gives Joseph this robe of many colors. It calls it a robe. It calls it a tunic. It calls it a coat. Uh, it's, it's, you know, an outer garment. And many colors. He was not wearing a, a gay pride robe. You know, many people kind of portray that. It's his rainbow robe, a Joseph's robe, technicolor robe, or something like that. Uh, it probably means it was embroidered with many different colors, and it was royal. Now, you find these robes of many colors other places. You look, for instance, in um, 2 Samuel 13, verse 18. It talks about Tamar. Tamar is one of the daughters of King David. She is a princess. And it says, she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. In Psalm 45, verse 13, it says, the royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. You see the embroidery principle here? Woven with gold, she shall be brought to the king in a robe of many colors. And so this was common when someone was considered you know, royalty or the prince or someone who would inherit, they had these coats of many colors. And so he's treating Joseph even from an early age as royalty, so to speak. He's the son who's going to be inheriting all things. So Jesus and Joseph were both the firstborn sons through miracles. Rachel had been barren, but through the prayers of Jacob, she finally brings forth. The Bible tells us that um, Joseph's father loved him more. He is the beloved son. Look in John 5.20. It says, for the father loves the son. The Bible tells us, of course, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is the beloved son of the father. And so you've got that beloved son relationship. Uh, and it is so obvious it's spilling over that it's really bothering the other brothers. So next we see Jesus, I'm sorry, next we see Joseph. I see them both. I have double vision when I read this story. Next we see Joseph as the rejected sibling shepherd. I'm going to read now, backing up to Genesis 37, verse 2. This is the history of Jacob. Jacob being with, uh, Joseph being with Jacob, he was 17 years old, feeding the flock. It tells us he's a shepherd, and it tells us that he feeds the sheep. That is another type of Jesus. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, that kind of sounds like Joseph might be a, a tattletale, but Joseph's actually grieved by the wicked things they're doing. And he's protesting. Why was it that Cain killed Abel? Abel was trying to remonstrate with his brother who was doing something wrong. Cain became angry and killed his brother. Why did the religious leaders hate Jesus and want to kill him? Because of Jesus' badness or because of Jesus' goodness? See, the very fact that they are doing, the brothers of Joseph are doing wicked things means they are not good shepherds. And Joseph is a good shepherd. He is a type of Christ, a good shepherd. Notice, he's bearing testimony to the father of their evil deeds. John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus is speaking. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. This is exactly what Joseph did. Jesus testified to the Father of the sin of the world, and of course he died for the sin. Now, did Joseph have problems with his brothers? He does. Did Jesus have problems with his brothers? He does. And you can read here in John chapter 7, verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, to make matters worse, uh, there's a lot of baggage in the family. I mean, it's, you've got, uh, this man's got four wives. He's got 13 children, 12 boys, one girl. Um, they, uh, you, you can read about even before they left home, you know, Rachel stole the gods of her father. Jacob later needs to tell his family to bury the idols in their jewelry. They had, uh, false worship had kind of gotten into the land. And um, then the boys lied. Uh, Dinah 
slept with the son of Shechem, Hamor was his name, and then the boys tricked this whole town of men into being circumcised. They come in and they, Simeon and Levi, who were the brothers of Dinah from Leah, they kill all the men and they basically take everything from this town. So now you've got all of the, the women and the children of Shechem are part of the servants of the household. So there's hundreds of servants, lots of cattle and sheep, and um, there's a lot of baggage in the family. And the boys would go off and they would be misbehaving when they were out taking care of the flock and Joseph would come back and with a broken heart he'd tell his father, he'd say, you know, things aren't getting better. Now Joseph starts having dreams. You can call them visions of grandeur. And he tells his dreams. In Genesis 37, verse 8, that you can read where Joseph says he has this dream. I've got a picture of it here on the screen. He dreams about this sheaf. And a sheaf is a bundle of grain that's been harvested, wrapped, and they would stand them up in the field so that they would dry. You lay them down, they rot. You have to stand them up so they dry. And Joseph said, I dreamed, and we were all harvesting sheaves. Not only were they shepherds, they were farmers like Isaac. And Joseph says, I dreamed, and my sheath stood up, and all of these other 12 sheaves bowed down to it. Well, they all understood what that meant, or the other 11 sheaves. That would be the brothers. And his brother said, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. I want you to notice as we read this that it doesn't get better. Um, you look, and it tells us that they hated him. And then he, he, Joseph, you know, he's not trying to brag about his dreams. I think he's just, he's, he believes this is a divine revelation. He wants them all to know about it. I got a new Bible here, and the pages are sticking together. There we go. So it tells us here in um, verse 4, his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, and they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. And he'd say, please pass the lentils, and say, well, you want more lentils, you probably get twice as many lentils, and you're a pig, and they just couldn't, no matter what he said, they couldn't say anything nice to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Go down to verse 8. And his brothers said, shall you indeed reign over us? He has this other dream about the sun and the moon. Uh, bowing down and these 12 stars and, and they hated him even more for his dreams and his words and when he tells a dream about the sun and the moon and the 12 stars bowing down to him the father heard that and he thought well if the boys are the 12 stars the sun and the moon uh, is that the mother and father and even Jacob has to get after him and say what is this dream that you dream shall your mother and I and here he's speaking about Leah probably which is technically Joseph's aunt Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down and bow down to you before you? Now Joseph, he used to say, I've had this vivid dream from God. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but I felt like I need to tell somebody. And was his dream true? Was it going to come true? He's young and he's innocent. He doesn't know what to make of it. And so they hated him even more for his dreams. Well, what about Jesus? They said, Will you indeed reign over us? That's what his brothers said. You know, Jesus tells a parable in Luke 19, 14. His citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. The exact same wording that you find in the story of Joseph is a parable that Jesus uses to explain that his own people were going to deny him as king. And then it tells us there was a problem with envy because of the favoritism. Genesis 37, verse 11. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Acts chapter 7. Now here in Acts chapter 7, you've got Stephen preaching about Joseph. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt. So even in the New Testament, it says there was a problem with envy. Well, what about Jesus? Was there a problem with the religious leaders being envious about Jesus? The Bible says so. Matthew 27, 18. For he, Pontius Pilate, this is during the trial, Pilate knew that they handed him over because of 
envy. Why did they envy Jesus? Because the religious leaders were doing everything they could to get the praise and the worship of men. They'd pray these long prayers, trying to impress people with their piety, and they're really doing it while they rob widows' houses. And Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does. But they prayed to be seen of men. And they, ga they gave to be seen of men. they blow the trumpet, everyone would look. They wanted the attention of men, they wanted the crowds. And now when the crowds and the multitudes began to follow and believe in Jesus and talk about his miracles and sing his praises, how did the priests and the religious leaders respond? They were furious and jealous. Envy. Envy is like poison. And yes, even religious people struggle with envy. Proverbs 27, verse 4. Wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before envy? Proverbs 14, verse 30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. And uh, if the truth be told, there are a lot of Christians that struggle with envy, that maybe someone else in the family, like Jacob's family, or it might be just someone else out there in the world, and they're doing better. I had one brother confess to me that he was angry. He's a Christian all his life, but he was angry and envious of his brother all of his life, and he finally had to come to terms with it, and, and God forgave him and saved him from those feelings. He said, my brother didn't do anything wrong. He was, he was just excelling and succeeding and doing so much better than I was doing that I envied him, and it was, it was just wrecking his experience with Jesus. There's people that struggle with the idea that, you know, you've only got one scoop and someone else has two. And it just, it eats away at him. Well, you read it there. His brothers hated him. They hated him more. They hated him even more. So this is a deep-seated hatred. So when they get their first chance to express that hatred, it doesn't go well. It says that finally, Jacob says, I need you to seek for my brothers. So if you look here in Genesis chapter 37, verse 16, uh, Jacob calls Joseph, and he said, uh, haven't heard from your brothers, no message. I want to know how they are doing, taking care of the flock. They're taking care of thousands of sheep that Jacob has. And he said, uh, I want you to go find them. So Joseph is sent from the father to seek his missing brethren. Jacob seeks Joseph to find the lost. Now, do I have to... Uh, Make a strong case for this, or is it pretty clear to you that that's the mission of Jesus? To seek and to save the lost. That's what Christ said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And you can read in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, he answered and he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was Jacob's name? Israel. Israel, Jacob, same person. Now, did Jacob have some lost sheep? His sons with the sheep. He didn't know where they were. So he sends his beloved son to find his missing children. Can you see the story of Jesus in the story of Joseph? From the father. Well, when they see him coming, now, first of all, what happens is he goes to Shechem, where they were supposed to be. And by the way, where Jesus sits down and talks to the woman at the well, that's Shechem. When he reveals, he says, I am the Messiah, it's in the very place where Joseph was looking for his brethren. And he goes and they're not there. And a man sees him wandering around the fields and he's going like this, and this man, and we don't know who this man was, just a man says, what are you seeking? He said, I'm looking for my brethren. And, you know, 12 brothers, thousands of sheep, it's hard to miss. He said, oh yeah, I heard them say, they were going to Dothan. Dothan means two wells. Was there a time at the resurrection when uh, Mary was looking for Jesus and she said to a man, she says, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. He said, what are you seeking? She said, I'm seeking my Lord. And you wonder, who was that man that directed Joseph where to find his brothers? That could have been what you call a Christophany. Could have been an angel. And it could have been just some local yokel. We don't know, but I like to think the first. Looking for his brothers. Well, when they see him coming, he starts to make his way towards Dothan. 
It's a, a valley. By the way, it's later in the city of Dothan where Elisha asks his servant's eyes to be opened and he sees the chariots and the horses of fire surrounding Elisha and that little town. It was a, a small spot and they had a few wells that were drilled in the ground and cisterns and, and evidently one of the cisterns didn't have water in it. We'll get to that in just a moment. So as Joseph comes over the hills from Shechem and he's going into the valley where Dothan is. Now there were hills around Dothan because the Bible tells us when Elisha has this vision and he tells his servant's eyes to be open, it says, in the hills around Dothan, they were full of chariots and horses of fire. So it's down in a valley. And they see over the hill, somebody's coming. And the glint of the sunlight on this individual approaching tells that he's got a beautiful coat. And they said, oh, no, tell us it isn't true. Here comes the dreamer. They had a lot of names for Joseph. Some of them we probably couldn't put in the Bible. They said, here he comes. And what are they thinking? It says, they plot and they conspire. It says in verse, uh, chapter 37, verses 18 and 19, before he ever reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer. Come now, let us kill him. Now, did that happen to Jesus? Were there religious leaders that wanted to plot against and conspire to kill Jesus? Yeah. You can read here where it tells us in Matthew 26, verse 3, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they plotted to take Jesus by trickery. They conspired, they plotted, they conspired with Judas to take him, to kill him. And Caiaphas said, do you know nothing at all but that it's expedient that one man should perish to save the nation? They had their minds made up that Jesus had to die, that it could not go on. So you notice that both Joseph and Jesus were men who were rejected by their brethren because they wanted the inheritance. But God raised them up to be the judge of their brethren, both Joseph and Jesus. Now, of course, I'm getting ahead, but I don't think I'm spoiling the story for you. How many of you remember when Jesus shares a parable of these wicked men, and it says that this man leases out his vineyard to some vine dressers, and part of the deal is that he's supposed to come and receive some of the fruit when it's harvest time. And he sends his servants that he might receive some of the fruit, and they beat up his servants and send them away. He sends others, they beat him up, and they stone some. And finally the man says, I will send my son. They will respect my son. That's not how they respond. They say, this is the heir. By the way, this is in Mark 12, verse 7. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. What were those boys thinking when they saw Joseph coming? Daddy's little angel. He's going to inherit everything. Here he is, our younger brother, and he's going to rule over us. That did not set well with him, especially with all the dreams and that he was telling their evil reports to the fathers. They just hated him. You know, Jesus either evokes love or hatred. Christ said, you're not with me, you're against me. And because their lives weren't right, they saw Jesus as a, a real problem. And because Joseph's life was godly, it made their badness stand out. They didn't like the idea that uh, here their younger brother was going to be treated as the firstborn. Now, sometimes this really throws people for a loop. Uh, most of you know, some listening may not know, Jesus was not the oldest in his family. Jesus was the youngest among his brothers. There are several reasons that we know this. Joseph... Jesus' father, by the way, um, you know there was a Joseph at the birth of Jesus and there was a jo Joseph at the death of Jesus. So Jesus' life is bookshelf between two Josephs. Joseph of Arimathea comes and put him, puts him in his tomb and there's a Joseph there in the manger to help him come into the world. It's interesting, isn't it? So... Uh, Joseph was probably married before he married Mary, and he had some other children. And we know that Jesus had at least four brothers. They are given 
by name, but then you read that it says he had sisters. We don't know that could have been at least two because it's plural. Um, the reason we know that is for one thing, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, if Joseph was still alive or if he had other blood brothers, why would Jesus commit the care of his mother to the apostle John? Another thing to consider, Joseph must have been older than Mary because by the time Christ begins his ministry, uh, Joseph is never to be seen again. In fact, the last time you hear about Joseph is when Jesus is 12 years old. So Joseph had probably had another family and his first wife had died and then he, he took Mary. The other reason, one more reason, is if Jesus was the firstborn, it would have been considered very um, bad policy for him to leave the family that has a family business, to leave Mary with all his brothers and sisters and go out and become an itinerant preacher without an income. The firstborn was responsible to stay home and work. You know the parable of the two brothers? Firstborn stays home. He takes care of everything. That's why he gets the double portion. So Jesus was also, like Joseph, the youngest. Of course, Joseph also still had Benjamin. But it bothered the brothers that the youngest was going to get the inheritance. They said, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they plotted and they conspired. Now he comes to his brothers with the very best of intentions. He's come to seek their welfare, to say, oh, I'm glad you're, so, oh, you're all right and everything's good and you guys got anything to eat. I am thirsty and I am hungry. But what happens when he comes? He's come from the Father to seek their welfare. The Bible says they take him and they strip him. Genesis 37, 23 so it came to pass when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. You know, the Bible tells us the devil strips us. What happened to that man that fell among thieves? The Bible says they robbed him, they beat him, and they stripped him. When those seven boys tried to cast out a devil, a demon came over that man, the sons of Sceva, and that demon-possessed man beat up the boys, chased them out of the house, wounded and naked. What happened to Adam and Eve when they had an encounter with the devil in the garden? Did he strip them? Their robes of light? Jesus comes to this world, and they take away his robe. They strip him. You can read here in Matthew chapter 27, verse 28. Then the soldiers stripped him, and after beating him, it says they put a scarlet robe on him. So they take away Jesus' seamless robe and they put a scarlet robe on him. What is scarlet a symbol of in the Bible? Though your sins be as scarlet. So Jesus bears our sins and they took away Joseph's robe. Notice what happens here. And they throw him in a pit. You can read in Genesis 37, verse 24, then they took him and they cast him into a pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. This is a symbol for the grave, for the tomb. Now, if you think I'm making that up, look at Psalm 88, verse 4. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. What is that pit a symbol of? The grave. After Jesus was stripped, did he also go to the pit for you and me? You see, the whole life, isn't this amazing? Is it just me or is it this incredible? See, Joseph's a real person, but his life through the providence of God becomes a, a template so we can recognize Jesus when he comes. Everything that's happening to him. So he goes down to the pit. You can read here in Genesis chapter 42, verse 21, now this is, I want you to know I'm jumping ahead a little bit just to give you the context. You can read that when the brothers are later being tested by Joseph, they don't know Joseph's listening in. This will be our subject for next week. One of the things they specifically mentioned, Genesis 42, 21, I know I'm jumping ahead, but just notice this verse. They say to each other, they don't know Joseph's listening, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. So when they take Joseph and they strip him, he's pleading with them, brothers, what are you doing? 
and they throw him down into a cistern that he can't climb out. It's a deep pit, and there's no water in it. He has nothing to drink. And to make matters worse, the Bible says, after they throw him in the pit, they hate him so much, they sit down and they eat. And they can hear his voice echoing up out of the pit. Issachar, Judas, Simeon, save me. Don't leave. This is not funny. Don't leave me like this. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I shouldn't have said anything about the dreams. It's a God gave me a dream. I didn't mean to cause a problem. And, and you can just, and the brothers are so cold hearted that they sit down to eat. Isn't it amazing that the religious leaders put Jesus on the cross and then went home to eat a ceremonial meal? They wanted to make sure that he died before the Sabbath began. They actually went home to keep the Sabbath after killing the Savior. So you're not saved by Sabbath keeping, are you? The people who killed Jesus were Sabbath keepers. Now, I believe in, in Sabbath keeping. They also gave tithe. I believe in tithe. You know, they also prayed. I believe in prayer. So just because they did these things, I hope you understand, those are good things. But they were doing them for the wrong reason. So it tells us when you look at that other verse there in uh, Genesis 42 that Joseph was there in the pit crying and calling and pleading. Don't do this to me. But it gets even worse. You read in Genesis 37, verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal. And they lifted their eyes, and while they're eating, there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Now these are the descendants of Ishmael, the brother of Isaac, the grandfather of Joseph, or great-grandfather of Joseph. Uh, yes. And um, it tells us they see they're coming. They, they become the desert truckers. They're trading. And they're coming from Gilead. This is the area around southeast of Galilee. Where was Jesus' ministry? Wasn't it in the area of Galilee? Now, Gilead is especially famous for its spices. And you can read about that in, in uh, Jeremiah. It talks about the balm in Gilead. You ever heard that song, There is a Balm in Gilead? And they had precious spices there like frankincense and myrrh. And so these, these traders come by. They've not done anything wrong. And Judas is saying, why do we want to just kill our brother? Judah, not Judas, but it's actually the same name. He says, no sense killing him. Let's sell him to the Midianites. And so the Midianite traders pass by him in verse 28. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. It's interesting. After Jesus was born, some wise men came with spices. And then Joseph, using the spices, goes down to Egypt. And they're sold there to help pay for their stay in Egypt. The gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. Now, you might be thinking, well, Jesus is sold for 30 pieces of silver. But Judah sells um, Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. But what do you think the Ishmaelites sold him for when they got to Egypt? For, don't you think they would buy him at a reduced price and sell him for a profit? Isn't that how you do business? You with me? Now look here in Exodus chapter 21. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, Exodus chapter 21, verse 32. If an ox gores a male or female servant, you shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver. That was the price of a servant. So when they take Joseph down with the spices and the myrrh, having come from Galilee, and they sell him for a profit, probably 30 pieces of silver. And it's Judah who suggests it. Judah in Greek is Judas, the same name, who ends up selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now what they've done in selling their brother for a slave is a capital offense. You read in Exodus 21, verse 16, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he's found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. You know, we have all sinned against Jesus, and the wages for sin is what? Death. 
We are all responsible for his blood. Just consider this. Here, he's betrayed by the twelve on the advice of Judah, sold for the price of a slave, for silver. It could have been another currency. Jesus is betrayed for silver, handed over to the Gentiles under the influence of his disciples, and especially his disciple Judas. Now, you can read that uh, when Reuben comes to the pit, Reuben wasn't there when this happened. He returned to the pit to help set Joseph free, and he's not there. He tore his clothes. The Bible tells us that when Christ was tried, the high priest tore his clothes. Reuben was the firstborn. He was the one in charge, kind of like the high priest at that time when they were out of town. And then now they've got to cover their terrible sin. And it says that when they had scourged Jesus, they led him out to be crucified. After they took Jesus' robe, they whipped him, and this is that seamless robe, and they put the robe back on him. What happens to the robe? If a person's whipped and beaten, um, they got blood on their back. You ever get injured and you put a shirt on and you stain the shirt? A lot of you men do it when you shave. Get yourself shaving. That robe that Jesus was wearing was a blood-stained robe. So now the brothers have a predicament. How are we going to uh, get word back to our father? His favorite is gone. And then they, they come up with this idea that, um, oh, by the way, I want to read to you in John 19, 23. So the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they made four parts to each soldier apart also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top in one piece. And they said among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled that says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So notice what happens here with the, the clothing of Joseph. So they took Joseph's tunic, and they killed a kid of the goats, and they dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to the Father. They didn't even go in person. They sent it by a messenger. And they say, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son? They don't see our brother, do they? Do you know whether this is your son's tunic or not? And of course, Jacob recognized it. And he said, my, it is my son's tunic, a wild beast called sin, has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes, and he put on sackcloth on his waist, and he mourned for his sons many days. And I want you to notice something. The blood of the lamb is used to represent the blood of the son. For the first 4,000 years, of church history until Jesus dies on the cross, whenever they sacrificed the blood of a kid or a goat, what did that blood represent? When the father saw that blood, he saw the blood of his son. When they brought that blood-stained robe to Jacob, it was just the blood of a goat, but he saw the blood of his son. So all those people in the Old Testament who are saved are saved by the blood of the son because the father saw the blood of the son in those sacrifices. Does that make sense? How did the brothers cover their sin? They present to the Father a blood-stained robe. How is our sin covered? We claim the robe of Christ's righteousness. It's that blood-stained robe. You know, there's only one thing that Jesus leaves behind. He leaves behind a blood-stained robe. And it's the only earthly possession that we know about that remained intact. I remember years ago I was in um, the Philippines uh, doing an evangelistic meeting. Karen was on her way to join me. Some of you know this story. And um, we got the worst news any parent could get is that our oldest son um, had an accident with a bulldozer. Um, moving the bulldozer, it rolled. They had not put the cage on it yet and he was badly injured. And then we got a second phone call. He made it to the hospital, but he did not survive the surgery. 
they couldn't stop the bleeding in his, his liver. And more, to get that news when you're thousands of miles away, Karen just got off the plane, I had to tell her what had happened. And flying to the Philippines, and we got on another plane, the country was, they were having a battle over who was president, the airport was locked down, or very few flights, and through a miracle, we got a flight back. And after coming back, I told Karen, I said, I'm going to go up and see the kids right away. I didn't even spend one night. I drove up to Kovala where the accident took place. And the next morning, I went to, um, to see the, his friends and, uh, that he was working with. And, and there was the bulldozer. Um, and I saw my son's blood. And, you know, that's when it, it really hit me. Is... Um, Heaven forbid, you know, I read the story of Jacob and I think it maybe does something more to me than it might do to some because I know how he felt when he looked at the blood of his son and knew that he was gone. Now to think, would Jacob say, look, in order to save all of my family, I needed to have this experience. He probably would have done it as much as he loved Joseph. Through Joseph's suffering, all of Israel is saved. We'll find out before we're done next week. Through Jesus' suffering, all of the human race that can be saved is saved. And it's all coming through the Father looking at that blood-stained robe. Now, friends, uh, whether you believe it or not, this story is miraculous, and it's telling us about Jesus, and it's telling us about the plan of salvation. It's telling us of how the Father loved the Son and the Father suffered that we might be forgiven, and Jesus shed his blood for us. And Joseph didn't really shed blood. It was the blood of a goat, but it's a symbol of the blood of Christ, and Jesus did shed his blood for you, that you might be forgiven, that he might save you from that evil beast, the devil. And that's the only way to be delivered from your sins and from the enemy is through faith in that love, in that blood.